Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to all of you who are here and all of you who are watching online. I'm Adam White from the American Enterprise Institute, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this conversation on the question of whether the administrative state is morally legitimate. Uh, it's a particular pleasure to get to do this event with our friends at the Catholic University of America's Project on Constitutional Originalism and the Catholic Intellectual Tradition. And with that, I will turn it over to my friend, Professor Chad Squitteri. Here today, uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Chad Squitteri. I am an assistant professor of law at the Catholic University of America's Columbus School of Law, where I also serve as a fellow within the Project on Constitutional Originalism and the Catholic Intellectual Tradition, or CIT for short. So at CIT, we promote scholarship, uh, examining the relationship between American constitutionalism and the Catholic intellectual tradition. And that tradition is rich and deep and includes figures such as St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas, but also figures that didn't hear the gospel, such as uh, Cicero and Aristotle. So at CIT, we promote our mission through events such as this, uh, guest lectures, conferences, and fellowship opportunities for uh, young lawyers and, and law students. Um, and today we're, of course, uh, co-hosting with AI. so I thank Adam and the rest of you all at AI for your hospitality and all of the work that went into today's event. So today's event uh, is titled in the form of a question, uh, is the administrative state morally legitimate? And to help answer that question, we're uh, joined by some uh, experts in administrative law. And the way today's panel will work is we'll have um, each of our uh, panelists will offer about a 10 minute opening presentation and then I'll ask them maybe a question or two uh, to get the conversation going. And then when all of our panelists have um, finished, I'll ask the panel themselves uh, some additional more questions to kick off the Q&A. And, um, but perhaps most importantly, then we will turn to audience Q&A, uh, so both online and for those of you uh, here with us today. So online, you can submit uh, questions to Sophie Rosari at AEI.org. That email is at, on the uh, event webpage. You can also submit questions on Twitter by using the hashtag AEIAdminLaw. So we will start off by hearing from the Honorable Paul Ray. Uh, Paul Ray is a director of the Thomas A. Rowe Institute for Economic Policy Studies at the Heritage Foundation. In 2020, the United States Senate confirmed him as administrator of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, or OIRA, within the White House's Office of Management and Budget. So prior to OIRA, he served as a counselor to the U.S. Secretary of Labor and a law clerk to Judge Deborah Ann Livingston on the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, as well as a law clerk to Justice Samuel Alito of the United States Supreme Court. He is a graduate of Harvard Law and Hillsdale College. So I'll turn it over to Paul. Great. Well, thank you, Chad, and uh, thank you all for having me uh, today. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, so uh, the, the question that's our topic uh, today uh, seems to ask for a yes or no answer. I'm not going to give one of those, at least right now, my opening remarks. What I want to do is, is, is um, raise a, a, a respect in which the administrative state is morally problematic. That's a, different, uh, that's a different thing than answering the question outright. And I want to raise what you might call a moral problem about the administrative state. And, uh, and to do that, I want to draw on the work of John Finnis. I don't know if there, are, if there are John Finnis readers in the audience. Well, I know some of you are John Finnis readers who are in the audience. So, uh, so I, I'd like, really, you can think of, of what I'm about to say as a prolonged meditation, not prolonged too long, don't worry, uh, but a prolonged meditation on, uh, on the good of practical reasonableness that Finnis talks about in, uh, in, his, in his body of work. So um, as, as those of you who are Finnish readers know, uh, he, he offers in his, in his work that practical, practical reasonableness is a, is a basic human good. We are better off being practically reasonable than not being practically reasonable. And what it means to be practically reasonable is to pursue goods intelligently. So that is to say, uh, practical reasonableness is kind of, a, uh, kind of a funny good because it consists in pursuing other goods intelligently. Uh, so in other words, in any situation in which you might pursue uh, some good, say the good of aesthetic appreciation or friendship or healthy living, um, there are in play uh, two potential goods, the good you might achieve through your efforts and the good of being at work in, practical, in practicable reasonableness 
to achieve it. So in every opportunity to engage in what we might call a human end, uh, there are not one, but two uh, basic human uh, goods or basic human values in play. Um, so if we are to, uh, well, a, a briefly, a sort of quick way to encapsulate this idea is that it's better to be a cause than not to be a cause. Right? We're, we're better off um, being causes of our own thriving and the thriving of others than having, than sort of stumbling upon, uh, upon that thriving. Um, so if we want to be at work in practical reasonableness, we need opportunities to do that. Uh, and part of the common good of, uh, of any society would be a set of opportunities that create op uh, chances to be at work uh, in, in practical reason. Uh, those opportunities can be found in the subject matter that, um, that the government regulates, regulates and in the operations of the government as well. So that is to say, uh, one, um, one part of the, uh, one aim of politics can be realized in part in political practice itself, right? The, the, the good of politics is, is partly a reflexive good. Politics, uh, if it's a, a, a reasonable politics, aims, among other things, at, at being at allowing people to be at work in practical, practical reason, and they can be at work in practical reason in politics itself, as well as in all the, all the activities of life that, that politics regulates. Um, now, of course, societies may and, and, and often must uh, prioritize goods other than practical reason in, in various, um, various political choices, but it would be arbitrary to disregard the desirability of the exercise of practical, of practical reason. Uh, so in other words, it, it, would be, it would be arbitrary for a, for a society to structure its, its, its governing institutions in a way that disregards the value of practical reason. Uh, and, and of course, the, the same would be true for any attempts, uh, any any theoretical attempts to justify, uh, to, to to justify one particular institution or another. Any any theoretical attempt to say that this or that system is good or bad that doesn't take into account uh, opportunities that people have to participate in practical reason is is a is an inadequate um, justification. So I think this is the the theoretical underpinning for. Uh, or something f familiar to those uh, who, uh, who follow Catholic social thought, which is subsidiarity. Uh, I don't know if subsidiarity, does that, does that ring a bell for folks, folks in the room? Yeah, so um, subsidiarity, uh, the, the, uh, the word, or a, a cognate of the word, rather, appeared in a papal encyclical for the first time in 1931 in uh, Quadragesimo Anno, um, but uh, the, the concept dates back to Rerum Novarum uh, in the, at the end of the 19th century. Um, uh, the teaching in the encyclicals is that uh, uh, smaller bodies, the bodies of, of civil society, are, are denatured in some way if, they, uh, if, if their responsibilities are taken away from them and assumed by, by a central authority. And I think the, the framework that, um, that I've laid out here is the, is the theoretical underpinning for that assertion. That is to say, um, the, the groups... Uh, the various groups of civil society provide really important opportunities for people who are not, uh, not the political rulers of a society to engage in acts of practical reason, to pursue the good for themselves, and their neighbors, their communities, their churches, their businesses, etc. cetera. Um, if we don't have uh, those groups uh, undertaking important work, if everything is done by, by the government, then there isn't an opportunity for, uh, for um, people who are not rulers to engage in the good of practical reason. Um, so there are three important applications uh, of this principle that I want to talk about. Uh, one is uh, it follows that if a matter could be handled by a smaller group and not by the government, that there's a lot of value in leaving the matter with the smaller group. And so the government, if it's going to act reasonably, would never take on uh, a decision, uh, take a decision away from a smaller group unless it absolutely has to. Because when the government does so, even if it um, can, can take care of the immediate need as well as a smaller group can, it's deprived the members of the smaller group of, uh, of the opportunity to engage in practical reason. So that's, that's one application. The second application 
is that uh, the central authority doesn't just have an obligation to respect the, um, the ongoing work of, this, of the groups of civil society, but also has an obligation to affirmatively foster their ability to engage in important work. So that could look like um, making sure that a, a good physical and economic infrastructure are in place for the civil society groups to conduct their work. And a third application is that when the central authority must intervene, the intervention should be, should be targeted in terms of both scope and, and time. The central authority should respond only to the, the failure of the smaller group that's warranted the intervention, and it should evacuate the field as soon as it can. Um, it should um, intervene with a view toward getting the, the smaller group back on its feet as soon as possible. Um, so um, I think if we, if we look at the US administrative system, what you see is that it does not measure up to these three applications that I've described just now. Um, so you, you will not be surprised to hear that agencies have a tendency to focus myopically on their missions, on, on, on doing the, um, whatever the thing is uh, that they are specially suited to do. They don't tend to think a great deal about the opportunities for practical reason that they are, that they are depriving subsidiary groups of when they, when they pursue their missions. And that's not surprising, right, under, under Weber's um, work, of course, we know that a defining mark of bureaucracy is that it pursues, or that a bureaucratic agency uh, pursues a specialized mission. Uh, it has a certain uh, set of enumerated tasks that it, that it pursues, uh, tends to pursue at all costs. It's not very good at balancing pursuit of its um, enumerated tasks with other more generalized objectives, uh, like the need to foster opportunities for practical reason. Um, but I think where the U.S. administrative system really fails to, to comport with the applications of subsidiarity that I'm describing is the, um, when we consider that the central authority's intervention should be limited. Um, and especially when we consider that the central authority ought to intervene with a view toward ending its own intervention as soon as possible. Right? It's, a, it's a truism around Washington that once a regulatory program is created, it will be there forever. Right? Um, in, in, um, Congress very rarely revises statutes that create programs. Agencies rarely revise uh, their, their regulations. Uh, when they do revise their regulations, it's usually not to eliminate a program altogether. It's to modify the regulations in some way. Um, so uh, you know, it's, it's quite, quite rare uh, for, the, um, for the central authority to, to vacate the field once it's entered it. Um, so these are a couple of points in, in which I think the, um, the US administrative system does not uh, does not measure up to the norms of subsidiarity. And, um, and with that, I, I yield the balance of my time. Great, well, well thank you very much for those remarks. I, I wanna, my first question is to focus on that point about subsidiarity uh, and evacuating the field. Um, so, you know, we sometimes uh, use subsidiarity and federalism almost interchangeably, but there are, there are of course important differences. You know, one difference being with federalism uh, if the higher order of the federal government has the authority, they can act without a consideration of whether it is appropriate, right? Whereas under subsidiarity, you need that secondary um, question. So as you know, you know, it's often the case that if the federal government comes in and acts, they, they rarely evacuate. So how are, are, are there tools that could be deployed within the administrative state, or do they have to perhaps come from outside, such as you know, sunset statutory provisions or something like that, that would encourage uh, federal officials to not just exercise authority because they have it and they can, but to only exercise authority uh, when it's appropriate to do so. Like what types of tools could be used to, to ensure that? Yeah, yeah. So um, one, of the, um, one of the marks of genius of the founders is that they understood that, uh, that if government has authority, it's going to tend to exercise it, right? So there are pretty serious limits on our ability to, um, to force agencies to take subsidiarity into account if they, if they have uh, a power that would allow them not to take it into, in, into account. Um, so the, the principal um, thing that ought to be done is, is to deprive the agencies of some of their power. Um, that said, there, um, there are ways to use the, um, the Administrative Procedure Act in, in helpful ways to enforce uh, subsidiary and values, right? Um, there have been some cases thinking of one in the DC circuit in particular, uh, that have held that um, because the agency uh, failed to find that states weren't already adequately uh, addressing the problem, 
that the, that the regulation was arbitrary and capricious. It was uh, unreasonable, irrational for the agency not to consider um, uh, whether states were already adequately addressing the problem. And I think um, more could be done on that front, whether by, um, by states and other actors who are, who are pursuing problems or uh, solutions to problems that agencies want to tackle, um, informing the agencies of why their, their uh, efforts are already adequate, or, or through legislation that requires agencies to give um, serious consideration to, to that possibility. Great. Uh, the other question I want to ask you uh, concerns uh, your comments about you know, that, that focus of particular administrative agencies. So you know, working at a Catholic university, uh, one uh, writing that's important to me is uh, St. John Henry Newman, who wrote on you know, what the meaning of a university is. Um, and his, one of his arguments in a nutshell is you know, all the various forms of study and the pursuit of knowledge are connected. And he compared this to um, the man of one idea, to quote, whose life lies in the cultivation of just one science. The idea being, you know, when you're an expert in one area, you know, everything looks like a nail that fits your hammer. Um, so I think one entity that could help correct that and bring multiple various expertise together is OIRA. So I would just uh, be curious in your thoughts whether you think OIRA um, lives up to that task, bringing multiple, you know, broader scope um, uh, to bear on various questions, and perhaps in answering it, if you could just uh, remind our audience briefly of, of the importance of OIRA, which I'm sure is very, uh, um, m most of our audience, I'm sure, is already well familiar. Well, if, if, if most of the audience is already familiar with OIRA, that would be a first, uh, <laughs> uh, except when addressing OIRA. Uh, so, uh, so OIRA is the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. It's an office uh, within OMB, which is uh, itself a department of the White House. Um, uh, OIRA receives every significant regulation that agencies propose to issue, ex except for regulations from the independent agencies. And the agencies under executive order are not allowed to issue a regulation until OIRA signs off on it. So um, when OIRA receives a regulation, uh, it reviews the cost-benefit analysis of the regulation, and it also invites the views of every other relevant agency and office throughout the government. So uh, if there's a regulation from HHS about health insurance, well, that regulation would go to the Labor Department and to Treasury, certainly, because those are two departments that have a lot to do uh, with, uh, with the provision of health insurance for various reasons. They would go to the Domestic Policy Office in the White House, might go to uh, White House Council as well. Um, so, uh, so IRA, in addition to serving its own role of analyzing costs and benefits, uh, serves as, a, as an information and views aggregator. It pulls together the views of agencies across the government. Um, and Chad, to, to your point, um, you're absolutely right. OIRA does help the agencies um, compensate a little bit for their own for their own um, necessary limitations that are that are baked into their missions. So I think um, I think that is a, a helpful point. You know, um, that said, you're still not getting the the diversity of views that you say would get would get in Congress, right? Um, uh, and I think. That's, a, that's an important difference. Great. Uh, well, I stopped listening when you said I was right. So I, <laughs> I, I figured, uh, well, thank you for those comments. Um, I think we'll turn things over now uh, to Adam to hear his opening remarks uh, before going to some panel-wide argument or questions and answers. Uh, so Adam White is a senior fellow at AEI and the other co and a co-director of the Seaboard and Grace Center for the Study of the Administrative State at George Mason. Uh, he also serves as a public member of the Administrative Conference of the United States and will be the next chair of the ABA's Administrative Law Section. Uh, Adam has published widely in law reviews and national publications such as the Wall Street Journal and National Affairs. He previously served as a law clerk to Judge David B. Sintel on the D.C. Circuit and he earned his degrees from Harvard Law School and the University of Iowa. So Adam, take it away. Well, thanks, Chad. Um, one of the great challenges of following Paul on a... Uh, panel like this is normally on a panel like this in DC, if I'm on uh, with a, an experienced government official, I say, well, I can beat them on, on the theory. And if I'm on a panel with a bunch of academics, I say, well, I can beat them on the practicality side. Uh, but with Paul, you can't beat them on either. <laughs> so I'm just going to do sports jokes for the rest of this, uh, the rest of this panel. Um, the, the question, uh, again, is, is the administrative state morally legitimate? And I'll, I'll start with, with where I'll finish. Uh, the administrative state, it's not moral, not, nor is it inherently immoral. Um, but administration, rightly understood, has profound moral stakes, 
Uh, and the modern administrative state now does seem to undermine a lot of the, uh, the ways in which administration can and should and must reinforce or at least uh, help to foster morality. I'll start with a, just a discussion of modern administrative state. Um, limited, that would be a much longer conversation, but the, the modern administrative state in terms of, of these moral questions. Of course the administrative state today does immoral things, but that's true of any part of government in any time, whether in legislation, in execution, or in adjudication. Of course there will be, from time to time, governing institutions that, uh, that, that if, if not outright undermine or, or, or morality or, or do immoral things, will impede morality or, or help to undermine the morality of the public. Uh, in administration, I suppose that's especially true in the administration of war, in the administration of capital punishment and other matters of life and death, in criminal justice, matters touching on religion and the practice of religion and so on. So for me, in thinking about the question today, I try to frame it for, my, frame it for myself as more like this. Does the administrative state tend to make people more or less moral? And my answer is that I think the modern administrative state does have a tendency to demoralize in two senses of the word. And I'm going to explore both of those, the ways in which the administrative state can make us less moral and the ways in which the administrative state tends to demoralize us as citizens. In terms of making us less moral, let me start with, with uh, in a roundabout way, I'll get to that point, but I'll start, as always, with Hamilton, um, because I can definitely beat Paul on Federalist points. <laughs> um, any student of administration, any student of the modern administrative state, administrative law, uh, we'll read Federalist 70 and Hamilton's reflections on the need for energy in the executive. Um, but of course, it's important to read the lines that follow that famous quip. Why is energy in the executive a good thing? Well, Hamilton offers a few reasons, and he begins with maybe the obvious ones in, in foreign policy and national security. But then he says the steady administration of the laws. And I've, I've long thought that that particular phrasing of it is really underappreciated. Steady administration. You can have energetic administration that isn't necessarily steady. You can have steady administration that isn't necessarily energetic. Hamilton thought you needed both, and you needed energy for the sake of steady administration. Well, why was steady administration so important? You get a sense of, of his, you get, a, you get a sense of Hamilton's sense of steady administration. In Federalist 70 and in the Federalist Papers that follow, where he discusses the election of the president, the president's ability to run for re-election, the need for a four-year term, time and time again, Hamilton refer, returns to the theme of or what, the dangers of what he calls mutable administration. Right? The risk that if a president can't run for re-election, the president doesn't serve a reasonably long term. The danger is that each new administration will come in, come in quickly, and change everything. Um, since since uh, there are very few millennials in the room, I can refer to the Etch-a-Sketch when I talk about Etch-a-Sketches, the lost on millennials. But Hamilton recognized the difference uh, of treating government the way we as kids treated Etch-a-Sketches. You take whatever was written on it, you shake it, it all goes away, and you have a clean slate. For Hamilton, a mut mutable administration was the surest way to undermine people's trust in government and trust in one another. Just as Madison wrote earlier in the Federalist about the need to, to foster a healthy sense of veneration for our Constitution and laws, Hamilton makes clear in the Federalist that steady, good administration is another way in which you build, not veneration, uh, veneration of the administrative state, I guess, would be a different kind of moral question, <laughs> but at least a trust and confidence that laws on the books now would be enforced reasonably and with reasonable certainty in the years ahead. And that if the law is going to change, it'll be changed through the legislatures more so than through the executive branch. Of course, uh, each new executive is going to recalibrate. That's inevitable, and it's truly a good thing in a, matter where, in a nation where elections have consequences. Um, but you can have too much of a good thing, and there's a risk that uh, too much change from one administration to the next will create too much uncertainty. Um, so I guess the way I think of good administration then is that good administration, good steady administration helps to clarify, right? It helps to create more certainty. 
less uh, uncertainty, uh, less opacity, uh, fewer shadows, and, and more transparency, more clarity. Um, why is that a good thing? Well, as Hamilton uh, emphasized, but as all of us know, um, you need that certainty, that steadiness in administration so that you can live your lives, right? so that you can plan, you can build, you can go on knowing basically what the law is. And of course, the laws, again, they'll change. Congress will change them. Administrations will change. But at least, more or less, we have a sense of what our rights are and what our obligations are. And if nothing else, that helps us to get along in, a, in some ways, more easily with one another, right? We know what the baseline rules are for day-to-day -day living. We know how to change those rules if we want to, but we know they're not going to change too often. Um, and we have this baseline level with, with, with good laws in place, a baseline level of trust that we can build on with one another. Um, without steady administration of the laws, with the sense that with every new presidential election, everything is up for grabs, it undermines a lot of things. It undermines uh, our trust in government, it undermines the way in which we take law seriously as law. Um, but also, if our rights and obligations are constantly changing, we have to approach one another, at least in our legal relationships, with a greater degree of suspicion and doubt. We have to lawyer everything up. And speaking as a recovering lawyer, I mean, I don't like to pick on lawyers too much, but when the lawyers are constantly involved in everything and constantly trying to game out what's around the corner instead of what the law is today, it just reduces us to a lesser version of ourselves. Um, again, this presumes good laws in the first place, or at least not bad laws in the first place. But with good laws or bad laws in place, a bad administration has a way of making things worse. Good administration has a way of making things at least a little better. Um, so that's the sense in which I worry the modern administrative state makes us less moral by requiring us to act with greater suspicion and cynicism and doubt about what the law is and what our relationships to one another uh, through the law are. But when I said the administrative state demoralizes us in both senses of the word, you know, I do mean it demoralizes us in the more common sense, right? That it, 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 um, it makes us weary of government. It makes us weary of trying to participate in government. It makes us think that there's really no sense in getting involved in government at the local level at the national level, if all the really important things are going to happen exclusively through the administrative state. It's one of the reasons why Congress has become, um, a, in many ways, a much more cynical and much more reactive and much more accusatory body, because we assume that all the action uh, is in administration and the administrative state. Um, so it demoralizes us as citizens uh, by giving us less reason to really want to devote ourselves to governing institutions. And also, by the way, since the modern administration is a federal administrative, the modern administrative state is a federal administrative state, there's even less reason, as Paul emphasized, to get involved with governing institutions or civic institutions uh, at the state or local level or even at the non governmental level. We assume that everything is going to happen at the federal level in federal administration. And it's why, by the way, our politics today center around presidential elections. And each presidential election campaign has a kind of flavor of regime change to it, right? We become basically two, for politically engaged people, we become two warring tribes, two warring camps, each one devoted to either the party that's in power, which is to say in charge of the administrative state, or the party that's out of power uh, and waits for the opportunity to win the election, uh, put the proper government back into place, and seize command of the tools of power in government. There, too, again, I think, is a real demoralization of, uh, of, of our lives as citizens. Now, thinking about Hamilton, uh, the line I keep coming back to over and over again in recent years, it's in, it appears first in Federalist 68. And Hamilton liked it so much, he ends up quoting it back to himself uh, and his readers in Federalist 76. He thought only uh, judges and, and professors cite themselves. Uh, Hamilton did too. He says in Federalist 68, which is about the Electoral College, he says, um, the true test of a constitution is its tendency and aptitude to produce good administration. 
And that's pretty remarkable when you consider everything that Hamilton wrote about, thought about in constitutional government, to say that not just a good test or a true test, but the true test of a constitution is its tendency and aptitude to produce a good administration. Um, I think about that a lot because I think it's, that challenge is before us now more than any other time in recent memory, trying to think through what type of administration does our system tend to produce now? And I think it tends to produce uh, the kind of system that we've been discussing now in, in our, our criticism of the administrative state. Okay, one last point about uh, morality and the administrative state. Good constitutional administration is faith-based. I don't mean in the sense of like a faith-based initiative that we think about. It's, it's faith-based in the sense of faithful administration, faithful execution of the laws. There's a reason why the framers put into our Constitution an oath for the president, right? Other government officials and judges and members of Congress, they all swear oaths now too. The president's oath is in the Constitution and for a reason. The framers knew that the, the, the president would have a unique power and opportunity and temptation to execute the laws unfaithfully, right? Either to refuse or fail to faithfully execute laws they don't like, or to take the laws they do like and maybe take them too far. So there, the president swears an oath uh, to, faith to, to ex faithfully execute his office, and of course has the, the duty in the Constitution to faithfully execute the laws. We have that oath for a reason. The president's gonna execute laws that are vague. Laws are always vague, no matter how hard you try to write them carefully. Uh, Federalist 37, to keep quoting Federalists, right? But, but Madison and Hamilton recognized you're always gonna have some vagueness, maybe around the margins, maybe at the heart of the law, hopefully just at the margins. Good administration has to be an effort at liquidation, an effort to clarify and create certainty in the place of uncertainty. Uh, modern administration tends to do the opposite, and it raises real questions of whether presidents are being faithful to their oath to faithfully execute the laws. Um, if the administrative state demoralizes, then good Republican, small R Republican administration can remoralize. It can make us uh, more moral towards one another and more moral towards our governing institution. Again, the modern administrative state is not moral. But constitutional administration can be, and in our era must be. Thanks, Jeff. Great. Well, thank you very much for that, Adam. And uh, I didn't hear Paul correct any of the Federalist citations. <laughs> uh, I assume they were all correct. Yeah. Um, your point about the switches between pre policy of different presidential administrations. So uh, Aquinas, of course, uh, mentions that you know, the mere change in law uh, is prejudicial to the common good, right? Yeah. The, a similar point to what you're making. Um, and, I, and I think we, you know, with there's this political incentive when a new presidential administration comes into power, they want to uh, capitalize on, on, on their policy. So we have these heavy shifts yeah. um, between administration uh, between administrations. So I want to ask you how we might go about limiting those heavy shifts. Um, yeah. So one way we might go about doing this, and perhaps you can break news tonight and tell us you're dropping, is like a Wilsonian type idea, right? Where yeah. insulate. Uh, these administrators from politics, and they're going to be experts um, and just act in a um, non-political way. Uh, another idea might be, you know, some form of liquidation. And so, my question, first part is just, you know, how do we limit it? Or maybe just secondly, you know, as originalists, do originalists need to start thinking about how to constrain those types of um, changes, similar to how originalists over the decades. Uh, up till now have considered how uh, to interact with stare decisis in the judicial space. Yeah, yeah. Um, Justice Thomas and Justice Scalia, both in their time on the, on the court, their times on the court, both wrote brilliantly on this. And they're both absolutely right. The challenge is they disagree with each other. Uh, and the question is how could they both be right at the same time? Here's how I see it. Scalia wrote that in an era of broad delegation of power from Congress to agencies, presidential elections have to have consequences. The courts, instead of micromanaging policy judgments, should, allow, should give administrations space with things like Chevron deference uh, to make policy judgments. Then people can vote for a president, and those elections will have consequences. Um, and I agree with that. Justice Thomas is right, though, because at the end of the day, the law has to be the law. 
Congress writes these laws, the ex administrations execute them, uh, but the courts have to say what the law is at the end when they decide cases. And there's a risk that too much, that judicial deference becomes judicial abdication. At the very least, it's not really treating law as law anymore. It's treating it as like putty, right? policy putty. Um, the way I think they both got it right, which is to say I disagree slightly with each of them. Um, I mean, who am I? But I'm here on this panel. Um, I think Scalia is right in the short term. I think when a law is new, um, it's good for the courts. If there's, if there's genuine ambiguity or vagueness, I think it's probably good for the courts to leave a little space for administrations to try to liquidate the meaning of it. Um, and that requires good faith on the part of the administration. But give them some space. But at some time, at some point, the court does have to say what the law is. I think it should learn um, from the, 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 the work of administration. But at the end of the day, it has to impose some certainty on this so that we can channel our political energy then, not back to administrations, but back to Congress. Oh, well, picking up on your point about uh, back to Congress, and since we are here today talking about morality, I thought you know one good place to look would be the moral virtues, uh, one, of course, being fortitude or, or courage. Yeah. Um, and when I think about how that might apply to the modern administrative state, I look at a Congress who does not appear to have much fortitude in the sense that there are often you know, dangerous political decisions to be made in the sense that if you come out the wrong way, you'll be voted out of office. So the answer is rather than you know, to be courageous and answer those decisions as Congress, it's simply to punt it to an administrative agency and say, you know, go do good and figure that out for us. So my question is, um, do you think that read on the current landscape is correct? And if so, how can we encourage a Congress uh, to, to have more fortitude and take on these questions themselves? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to be quick. Um, I'll just say this. Oftentimes, Folks in, in, in our shoes tend to say, oh, you know, Madison said there'd be ambition, counteracting ambition. We have to worry, worry about Congress doing too much. We don't have that anymore today. Congress doesn't want to do anything except pass the buck, uh, and, and there's no ambition left. I, that's not true at all. Ambition still counteracts ambition. Today, uh, one party's ambition to be on Fox News counteracts the other, the other party's ambition to be on MSNBC, right? And just as Madison said, the interests of the man should be attached to the rights of the place. That's why ambition has been kind of deformed now. Right now, the greatest rights of the place, being a member of Congress, the greatest right is the right of publicity, right? This platform at hearings and elsewhere to say what you think, to make your opinions known. Congress has much more interest institutionally in doing that um, than in actually legislating. Why is that? Well, it goes to your second point. Congress has delegated so much power to agencies, and with every little delega every de delegation, big or small, they change their own incentives going forward. Because with each delegation, they created a greater interest in doing oversight hearings, right? More opportunities for oversight. We've reached the point now today where there's so much to oversee, there's less time to legislate, right? Um, just really quick, and I, I promise I'll shut up. Maybe the greatest sign of where things have gone wrong is this. We've, we're supposed to have a Congress that looks forward and writes, looks to the future and writes broad laws. We have presidents who look to the here and now, execute the law now, make prudential judgments, but focus on the present. Uh, and a court that looks at what's happened, the laws that were passed, and the facts that occurred, and decides cases. Congress delegated all of the, so much power to the executive that the executive now has to mostly act like a legislature, right? They have to draw broad rules to govern going forward. They still do execution in the here and now, but mostly the administrative states in the business of rulemaking. Meanwhile, the courts, faced with this onslaught of rules, sometimes ones that come about very quickly, they find themselves more and more having to intervene, being called upon by litigants to intervene, and they have to make prudential judgments, especially with things like preliminary injunctions, right? Decide what's the law probably mean and what are the equities at stake and what's the action we take now. In some ways, district judges today are the most energetic part of government, right? <laughs> They're acting in some, many, many ways like an ex executive. What's Congress doing this whole time? They're just waiting for everything to happen. They look at the laws that were made by agencies. They look at the facts that occurred. And they sit in judgment like a court of public opinion. The hearings actually look like a court, right? They sit arrayed like the Supreme Court, and they just kind of speak their mind and cast judgment. They're acting like courts. And it all started with delegation. 
Great. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, so now we'll turn to our third administrative law expert today, Professor Jen Mascott. Uh, Professor Mascott is an assistant professor of law at the Antonin Scalia School of Law, where she also serves as a co-executive director of the C. Boyd and Gray Center for the Study of the Administrative State. Uh, Professor Mascott has published in a variety of law reviews and her scholarship has been excited, cited extensively, including by the Supreme Court. Uh, she recently returned to George Mason after taking a leave of absence to serve in government, uh, where she had a double appointment as both Associate Deputy Assistant Attorney General and a deputy within the Office of Legal Counsel. Uh, she previously served as a law clerk to both Justice Thomas on the Supreme Court and then Judge Kavanaugh on the D.C. Circuit, and she is a graduate of George Washington University School of Law and the University of Maryland at College Park. So, Professor Mascott, I turn it over to you. Well, thanks so much for having me. Um, appreciate the dis discussion so far. And I guess I will start by just resisting a little bit the title of the panel today. The, you know, is the administrative state moral? Because I guess um, I think it might depend which administrative state or whose administrative state we're talking about. So if we're thinking about morality as good, something objectively true, something objectively right, I'm not sure that we could say that one particular form of government or set of procedures necessarily is perfectly moral and all of the others are not. I mean, I take a little bit more of a, I guess, a perhaps Augustinian view, perhaps differently than some of my co-panelists, where um, I'm not sure that any system of government made up by flawed um, humans is going to be perfect. So how would we evaluate um, the morality of our administrative state? And I think it would be if our administrative state has legal justification and is a system that is consistent with law. And so, you know, we'd have, to, and, and one thing that's great about our constitutional structure, I think, in our founding document is that it, um, is that it, I think, acknowledged sort of human nature and human conduct with some of the principles that Adam and others are talking about, where each of us left to our own devices, um, each individual is going to be, have the temptation to power, and so therefore try to structure a government with a set, with a set of procedures that would counteract the, our basest instincts and would not allow a group of individuals to coalesce with too much power unchecked. Um, and so if I was going to evaluate the morality of our U.S. administrative state, I suppose it would be, is it consistent with the system, the document that was supposed to authorize its creation, authorize the institution of the federal government? And so in that sense, I guess I'd be perhaps, can I claim the position as the most formalist or positivist here on the, on the panel, would that be okay? It's yours, I yeah. see Paul giving me a little bit of blood. <laughs> um, but I mean, so I really do think, I mean, we can look at precedent, we can look at pragmatics, we can look at what works, we can, we can think about a system of government certainly needs to be consistent with truth, with justice, allow those things to flourish. But I, for me, I'm looking paramount to what is the Constitution, what's the structure that the Constitution puts in place and is a system operating within those confines. And then even if it doesn't work the best or there's too much precedent, we don't necessarily evaluate it as to what works best from a modern standpoint. We have to always look back to its legitimacy. And so evaluated under that metric, unfortunately, I think there are many components of today's administrative state that really are not in any way legitimately operating under the constitutional system. And to the extent that we're going to debate that, I think it's, you know, within a certain range of history. I mean, it is the case that, um, you know, not all of us have spent a lot of time in the founding documents. We're often looking at something from a 21st century mindset. And so there is a lot of work to be done to figure out what administrative structures were in place. What does legislative power mean, executive power? What were the framers trying to institute? But even when there's a lot of debate or uncertainty, I mean, we're really talking about, you know, 200, less than 250 years ago, there are a lot of source documents. The debates within a relatively, I think, 
narrow range of disagreement, at least when you compare our system of government or contrast it with other systems around the world. And so I think it's a debate worth having, and it's, a, it's, it's worth looking back at how far our structures have strayed. And I think the main, actually, for formalists or for those who are concerned about our administrative state operating only within the confines of the constitutional structure, which would not really have a fourth administrative state, it would have departments underneath the executive power. So I think that's probably the main deviation right now, and a lot would be um, solved if actually all of the administrative entities were only operating under statutory power that Congress gave them and then completely subserving it to the executive. Because it would be interesting how much delegation and other course correction would have to take place if, every, if the executive really did have to meaningfully supervise, I think, all of the executive agencies, and then they had to operate consistent only with their statutory confines. But I think as a strategic matter, um, well, I think the biggest question to answer is just um, whether we are, you know, here thinking about philosophical principles or the law or we're litigators or we're instructors in the classroom is um, how much of this can we take on at which point in time? And there's so much to peel back. What's strategically the first deviation or first problem to solve, right? Because we can talk about the ideal of where we need to go, go back to limited government, um, we have not necessarily all justices who are in agreement, I think, on how to get there or what um, errors they would want to fix or be willing to fix and how stare decisis layers on. And so in a given case or in a given course or in a given paper, are we going to take on everything and go back to absolute purism or are we going pu something that's pure? Or are we going to think about incrementally sort of how to um, get back and return to... Um, first principles, and I fear sometimes that when we want to, um, just as a practical matter, get rid immediately of whatever the immorality or deviation is from the administrative state, that what happens is we settle and we say that something is true or is correct or is the original understanding that really isn't because we're trying to say originalism is, cons originalism is consistent with the system of government we think we can obtain now. And so one would hope, for example, if one's a justice on the Supreme Court, they might just honestly say, well, as an original matter, the executive branch would look like X. We've got stare decisis. We don't have a will to move it here. I can't get five votes, so we're going to move it, you know, 1% back in that correct direction, rather than suggesting that what we have now um, under modern principles in modern government looks anything at all like the um, administrative state that was... Um, Authorized. My, the one final point, I also I do worry a little bit too, and I'm sure folks in the panel will disagree agree with me or at least have thoughts on this. When folks, either who are here or not here, talk about common good or morality in the government and administrative state, sometimes I fear that we um, are giving the impression that the administrative state or the government can move us toward the common good in and of itself, like that just the government institution can do it, is responsible for it. And so I, I mean, the beauty of our constitutional structure is that it actually puts in place procedures. It doesn't often tell us substantively what to do. And it puts in place procedures that actually done correctly are going to lead to limited federal government and leave a lot of space for other institutions, like the church, religious institutions, the family, to operate, which I think is critically um, important and is really the only way that um, society or community or our institutions are going to move back to more of a moral place, because there's such a set of deep flaws in the human condition that we certainly cannot hope that our government's going to solve that or that the Ministry of State will ever itself be able to be. Um, moral or an agent effectuating the common good. Thank you. Uh, so to engage with your point <clears throat> about looking at it from, I guess, more of a formalistic um, uh, lens and the idea that, you know, there is no headless fourth branch of government. There are instead, you know, officers of the United States working within the government. You've done some work on the appointments clause. Um, so I was wondering if you can just share with us a little bit about that work and what that might tell us about uh, what the, the framers thought about who would be exercising uh, the federal authority. Okay, so the appointments clause gives just a limited set of procedures that are uh, authorized for selecting officers. And I think the way maybe that ties into the broader, broader theme of today 
is that the procedures that are put in place by the Constitution is to give a lot of accountability. Where does the accountability come from? Partly it comes from one branch sharpening another branch, as, as Adam said. But ultimately, each branch at the federal level, as we all know, to varying degrees, particularly the political branches, the ones making policy, the Congress making it, executive carrying it out, are accountable back to the electorate. And so, um, obviously, the branches on their own duking it out are not going to be able to bring accountability. It's the power to be able to vote people out of office who are errant and taking too much power. And so, when we're structuring a government, the, account, the appointments clause was a way to keep accountability for the president in um, selecting officers to fill well, under modern doctrine, important positions in the government. I guess the thesis of my initial paper um, was that the original meaning suggests that officers of the United States really was a large category of people who were carrying out any kind of governmental duty. And so really the accountability would extend all the way through, essentially down to the lowest levels of the executive branch. And that would mean, I mean, through the president's executive power, he'd have the ability to be able to supervise everybody so there would be accountability back to the elected head at the top of the um, executive department. The other thing that's interesting about the appointments clause and its um, provision of officers of the United States is that it, it um, implies that Congress has to establish anything that's an office of the United States by law. And so there's accountability, too, because the president on his, his or her own cannot just unilaterally create new positions, staff a huge executive uh, operation. That was um, clearly partly to respond to the abuse, the felt abuse of the um, English monarch sending officers, um, officials over to sort of dominate us, obviously, in the colonial era. Um, and so Congress has to create the position, the president or other folks that Congress um, specifies have to fill the spots. And I think in that, it's such an enormous responsibility of supervision, either directly by the president or all of his subordinates all the way down. There is a little bit of a slowing down the operation, I think, effect of that accountability that is consistent with this restrained nature of government. Thank you. Uh, and then I guess to ask about the point you made at towards the tail end of your opening remarks regarding, you know, roles for private institutions such as the church or, or more local entities. Uh, you've elsewhere written that, you know, the Constitution uh, outlines some purposes, you know, domestic tranquility, the blessings of liberty, um, general welfare, um, but does not necessarily say that the federal government itself needs to, to, to pursue all those purposes. Instead, there should be a role for perhaps private entities or, and more local entities. Um, so my question to you is, do you think the current administrative state leaves enough room for private and local entities? And if not, how can we improve that? Yes, so I think you are quoting from a review that I wrote of one of Adrian Vermeule's books where he suggests that there are several core moral principles of administrative law, and he seems to have a very rosy picture about how our administrative state is very close to effectuating this common good, but for a few procedural tweaks here and there, and his couple hundred page book with Cass Sunstein will guide us to the shared principles that will help bring about morality. So it was responding to that because um, I think there's a lot of reliance on the preamble of the Constitution's reference to general welfare and this idea, again, that government can completely bring it about, whereas I think if you read the preamble in conjunction with the Constitution, the suggestion is that the Constitution will set in place a limited set of structures that will allow common good and general welfare to flourish in large part. Um, through private and religious institutions, and if one believes that, then certainly no. Today's administrative state that often prizes efficiency over all else is diametrically opposed to that. I mean, look, if we compare our system to what's happening often around the world, I mean, there's an awful lot of evil and oppression out there, and in con you know, in comparison you know, somehow, blessedly, over 200 some years, we've been able to operate with a fair amount of freedom. But, you know, not everybody who's operating with power has a vision of trying to, I think, preserve liberty. And so, um, you know, the larger that our institutions become, the more all-encompassing, the more at risk we are. 
Great, all right. So then I'll turn over to more of a panel-wide uh, question and answer uh, portion now, maybe with a question or two, and then turn it over to the audience, both here and don't forget uh, online. Uh, so my first question is for the whole panel, maybe um, Paul, you can kick us off given that it does have an OIRA aspect to it. Uh, con <laughs> considering, uh, and now that everyone knows what, what OIRA is, uh, consider it, as far back as at least uh, Reagan, right? Uh, the executive branch through cost benefit analysis has been um, you know, really dominated by that form of decision making. And we can think of that, I think, as you know, using a particular moral uh, lens, consequentialism or you know, utilitarianism. So my question is, do you think the current administrative state is too focused on that type of consequentialist perspective to the detriment of other perspectives, such as in deontology, which would hold that there are just certain actions that are themselves immoral, you know, whether or not uh, they have enough benefits to outweigh the cost. Yeah, so uh, well, first of all, I have to say, uh, if, if there were any OIRA desk officers in the room, their heads would be exploding right now, and they'd be saying, the agencies are dominated by cost-benefit analysis? What? Uh, they, they would not agree with that characterization. But, uh, but, I, but I take the point. Um, so, I would say this, um, the cost-benefit analysis uh, to which regulations are subject occurs within certain parameters. Uh, some of those parameters are statutory, um, but others of those parameters are, are moral, right? Even if a statute were to, um, were to allow um, you know, uh, the achieving of great benefits by, by committing murder you know, per regulatory directive, um, agencies would, would quite, quite rightly decline to go out and murder people um, even if that were the most beneficial thing for them to do, right? And I, I can't think of, a, of any regulation in which an agency said, you know, we, we think what we're about to do is probably a really bad thing to do, but cost-benefit analysis makes me do it, you know? Um, I think uh, the agencies do, uh, do and authorize things that I, that I think are, are morally uh, bad or are wrong, but it's because they don't think they're morally bad and wrong. I would say so. I, I don't. I don't think that there's um, that that the the actual results of adherence to cost benefit analysis have, have that result. Great. Do and, and either of our other panelists have a thought? Well, I mean, I don't know. The cost benefit analysis would you, would you agree it's somewhat though inherently malleable? I mean, because now the factors I think being used perhaps by the Biden administration would be different than the Trump. Administration, So I do think as a net positive, the cost-benefit analysis is getting agencies to think about efficiency in a way they didn't before. But it strikes me as even with anything, if it's put in certain hands, the values, like it, um, it allows values that may or may not be ones with which we would agree or think are better morally or, or less good morally um, to be put in as benefits. Perhaps not to the extreme, I think, that Paul, but, but Paul's initial hypo, because again, I think in a positive way, we do still have sort of a minimum shared set of values in our country and system of government that helps to keep us from really going outside certain bounds. But there's a lot of the inner core that's really um, subject to disagreement. And so the question with all of this is who is going to make the determination about which moral values the government is going to um, support or, or impose. And um, so the less control the government has, the less risk we are at if those values get steered in the wrong direction. I guess I'd just say um, uh, OIRA is one of the greatest sort of achievements in regulatory reform and limited here, here. government that we've seen in, in, uh, in, 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 in decades. And it's a, it's a reminder of Justice Thomas's wisdom uh, in an article before he became a justice that the challenge of government isn't choosing between good values or, or institutions, but building institutions that embody good values. And, and in many, many ways, well, I already did that. But I am sympathetic to the concern that um, after 40 years, and despite uh, or, uh, Paul's best efforts and his successes, that there is sort of a flavor of technocracy around OIRA's role. That wasn't the original plan. Uh, OIRA in its original executive orders, and even under 12866, the Clinton order, it requires consideration of many other values. And under Paul's leadership, OIRA really pursued that part of its mission. Um, but the, the cost-benefit side of it does become a little uh, technocratic, and I worry that it, 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 
it, it gives short shrift to other values. I just say it's not it's much easier to run a cost benefit analysis on a program that will close down jobs or casinos, say, than uh, on a government program that's going to impede attendance at church. How do you run a cost benefit analysis on that? Um, so I do worry about that, and I, I've got a piece recently in this online magazine called Mosaic by the Tikva Fund, where I, this month where I try to explore that with respect to religious liberty. I mean, I, so I love Paul, and I, OIRA is great. I mean, OIRA, we work with OIRA a lot at DOJ. So this is not me. OIRA is great. They're doing good work. And I actually found it, uh, the folks there to be quite efficient and good and pleasant and um, really working closely with the other folks that you would expect them to work with. At the same time, I find it very sad and concerning that Ad, my my, my dear colleague Adam is describing this as the greatest regulatory reform in 40 years. I mean, then we are not aspiring high enough because OIRA is fine. But I mean, even within OIRA, are not most of the OIRA employees civil servants? They're not political appointees even. So even OIRA, which is allegedly within the executive office of the president, is not fully responsive to him or her and so I fear we have fallen short in our regular form. That's all true. I'm, I'm grading on a curve. <laughs> I, will, I will concede, arguendo only, that OIRA will not save the world. <laughs> Close, but not quite. Well, great. Um, all right, so another question I have is, you know, Professor Mascot, you mentioned uh, the Professor Sunstein and Vermeule uh, book. And, you know, one of the takeaways from that book is just pointing out that uh, much of administrative law is what we might think of as you know, judge-made law, judge-made common law, uh, uh, really. Um, and th there's like these limitations on agency action that cannot be you know, easily traced to statutory or constitutional uh, limitations. Uh, so for my question for each of you is, you know, do you think those types of judicial decisions, which do appear to make administrative agency you know, a bit more palatable, are those uh, an appropriate exercise uh, of the judicial power, or is, uh, should we instead be looking outside of the judiciary to implement those types of limitations on agency action? Well, which one or two specific principles are you uh, to? Uh, so I guess, you know, like requirements that, um, you know, limitations on applying law retroactively or requirements that you uh, give, um, um, be develop law transparently. Um, or, I mean, to, to use uh, perhaps uh, a new invention, um, the major questions doctrine, for example, so limitations uh, which are not clearly uh, um, rooted in statutory or constitutional limitations, uh, but nonetheless uh, limit uh, uh, agency actions. I mean, I don't necessarily think transparency should be an independent value imposed on administrative agencies, no. I mean, I think sometimes folks who are, um, supporting that are talking about what works best and what's fair and what's right. But um, I mean, unless Congress, I mean, I am a, am a big fan of Congress imposing proactive reporting requirements in a sense, because I think that's a, a, a lawful way for Congress to get information from the executive branch um, without going through like the song and dance of oversight. But no, I don't think when somebody is exercising executive power properly understood that there should necessarily be some extra expectation that it be transparent. In fact, if you look at the constitutional text, the branch of government that the Constitution imposes explicit reporting requirements on is Congress, not in any way on the executive. So I, I, would, agree, I, I would agree on that. I think that's just a good governance idea that people are trying to impose, but that, that, that wrongly applied can actually impede the effectiveness of executive operation. Yeah, yeah I agree. The APA is law, and of course, it, like any other law, it should be enforced on its own terms and not with judicial adjustments. Um, I have mixed feelings about the APA um, for reasons that Jen just sort of suggested, that, that it, it tries to govern administration by making it look more like legislation or more like adjudication, right? We teach administrative law, and what do you do? You spend weeks on rulemaking and how it's quasi-legislative. You spend weeks on adjudication and how it's quasi-court-like. The APA is largely a task of making administration look less executive, and there's a real loss in that. Hmm. So I support uh, 
the procedural protections of the APA, and I would love to see Congress enact more and more rigorous procedural protections. Um, that said, I am skeptical of the ability of procedural protections to constrain the, the president's power in a serious way, it can constrain the power of individual agencies. Um, but of course, the, the president has at his command um, uh, many agencies with, with many various powers. And so it's, it's very easy um, when a, a, a particular option is off the table uh, for, for, you know, for a particular agency to issue a particular regulation for the president to turn to another agency uh, to issue another regulation that um, may, uh, I mean, of course would, um, do something slightly different than the first regulation would have, but accomplishes the same overall presidential objective. And this is, this is my concern with, with um, Vermeule's um, procedural argument, is that it, it applies at the level of individual rulemakings, but the president uh, is, is never making his plans on the basis of individual rulemakings, right? Um, that's why you see it in, in executive orders. There will be an overarching objective that the president very candidly declares in section one or two, and then very often a series of other sections uh, directing consideration of rulemakings from, from many different agencies under many different statutes, all to pursue that one presidential objective, right? Um, so the, the presidential decision-making that goes into um, pursuing a particular political objective is in no way constrained by these procedures. Instead, the president will say to a trusted advisor, I would like to do large thing X, how would I do that? And his counselors will all think about how he might do it and report back that under the uh, under the relevant law, including the procedural protections of the APA, we think you might do the following six things and they'll pick out some of them to do, right? So, so the procedural protections in no way um, shape the, the political objectives the president is able, uh, is able to pursue. Great. Um, your uh, comment about the president's choices reminds me of just of a quip I remember learning in law school from my professional responsibility professor. He, uh, it, it was a quote attributed to J.P. Morgan, I think, who said, you know, I don't hire lawyers to tell me what I can't do. I hire lawyers to tell me how to do it. So mm -hmm. just kind of <laughs> brought that to mind. Um, before turning over to audience questions, I'll just have one more qu question, a bit more open-ended for each of our panelists. Um, you know, what changes in administrative law um, do you think we should be keeping our eye on at the Supreme Court level uh, over the next, say, five to 10 years? Anything that jumps out to you all? I would, I mean, there's a couple cases percolating, I think, in the lower courts that, I mean, th this term, two cases that the court has um, are mostly on jurisdictional questions, Axon versus FTC and Cochran versus SEC, which are trying to get at, I think, a key um, critical structural point, which is, are there constitutional problems with the tenure protections for agency adjudicators? who in previous years people haven't thought about a lot, but they are wielding quite a bit of power because they can impose significantly very large fines that the agency almost always upholds, or they can um, prohibit people from, like take strip people's licenses to engage in their um, chosen profession. Um, but this term, the court's just looking at whether you have to, a very basic question, whether essentially you have to raise that challenge within the agency structure first, or do the Article Three courts have jurisdiction at an earlier point to be able to hear the challenge. And it, you know, is it's a question that would impact perhaps several years of litigation within or challenges within agencies. Will the court take on the more threshold question about the structure in agencies? I hope it will. People are trying to get creative with making the court take on the question about how much um, officers have to su uh, be subordinate to the president's agenda so that the president, when he has the ideas that Paul is talking about, um, can fire those he needs to fire or instruct people to do certain things and we don't sit around having silly debates about whether the president should really be able to tell the FTC what to do or whether its agenda should be. Um, complying with that. And so there um, is a case that the Fifth Circuit decided, Jarkissi versus SEC, that um, right within the one opinion essentially says that the agency, people are not getting a proper jury trial right when their rights are adjudicated within agencies, that Congress has delegated too much power to agencies to decide whether to bring in-house enforcement proceedings or go to court, and whether there are improper removal protections. I don't, as of a week or two ago, the en banc petition had not been 
ruled on. So we don't know if the Fifth Circuit will rehear it on Bonk yet or whether it will go straight up to the court. Um, uh, Walmart is raising something that's trying to, with the FTC, an argument that's trying to get the court to revisit Humphrey's executor in sort of a unique kind of a way. Um, the court will eventually have to rule on some of these um, decisions and hopefully won't continue to just do so around um, the margins. The one final complicating thing is I think the justices are struggling with, um, many of them do have a first principles conservative view, small government view of the Constitution. But because of that, I think some, in particular Justice Thomas and Justice Gorsuch, are starting to evaluate what that means from their own remedial authority standpoint. And so will that mean that even if these cases reach them, they have modest remedies that then keep them from effectuating some of the structural change? Maybe, which would mean it really does leave it in the court of Congress to, I think, take action. Um, so we'll see. Structurally, Congress doesn't have a lot of incentive to act right now. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. I, I'd say also, um, you know, really, the West Virginia case, uh, the, the, the recent major questions case, opened up a, a new frontier. Um, there were um, there are many many factors in the Chief Justice's opinion for the court. It's not clear um, which factors have to be have to be present uh, to trigger application of the major questions doctrine. And so, I think the court is going to be called on to to flush out uh, the the contours of that uh, of that test in the next couple of years. Yeah. Of course, there's the deference and delegation debates, uh, and Chad's recent article on non-delegation is, is a must read for that reason. Um, I tend to think of a lot of cases that have come through the court recently are sort of sleeper administrative law or administrative state cases. The New York gun case, it was a Second Amendment case, but so much of the court's analysis really did reflect the administrative issue in the background, the sheer amount of discretion that the licensing officials had really colored the court's view of of New York's law and was really central to their decision. But in terms of straight sort of federal administrative state issues, I'd say the most interesting case I'm watching right now is the one out of the Fifth Circuit where they declared unconstitutional the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's funding mechanism. The CFPB doesn't get appropriations from Congress. Congress just gave it the power to go to the Fed every year and demand something like 12% of the Fed's operating uh, expenses. It's a pretty sweet deal. <laughs> um, I was, I'm not neutral on this. A decade ago, I was litigating this issue when I was still in private practice, but I've continued to follow it. And I think in some ways, the best way to understand it is, is it's about the power of the purse and Congress's appropriations power. Um, in some ways, it's just a sheer delegation of power, Congress delegating its power of the purse in whole to the CFPB for the CFPB's purposes. It's not about user fees funding part of the budget. The CFPB just declares its own uh, appropriations. They give a one-page letter to the Fed that says, we would like our $600 million now, and they get it. The Fed writes a one-page letter saying, here you go. Um, and I think, in so, I don't think this, this case wasn't litigated as non-delegation, but for me, it's a huge non-delegation case. It reminds me of the dangers that Scalia saw in the Sentencing Commission in the Mistretta case. The, the, the CFPB, for power of the purse purposes, is operating, like as Scalia said in Mistretta, a junior varsity Congress. Great, well thank you very much to our panelists. We'll turn it over now to audience questions. Uh, anyone in the room, perhaps in the front right here, I believe we have a microphone coming your way. Um, thank you. <clears throat> Excellent conversation, thank you very much. I'm Michael Maybach with the James Wilson Institute. Maybe I could frame the question this way. It seems that there are four functions of the Congress. One is to confirm officials, at least the Senate. Two, uh, pass and repeal laws. Three, appropriate funds. And four, oversight. And that one is the one that seems to be at the center of this discussion because we have a $4 trillion government now. So isn't this since you like Federalist Papers, uh, Federalist 45 problem, the Madisonian, you know, the, the uh, federal government's powers will be limited. So don't we really have a federalism problem with all these administrative agencies? Yeah, absolutely, right? I mean, so, um, so over the course of the last century or so, uh, Congress uh, basically every year has created new powers and given them to agencies. Sometimes it's created new agencies and given them new powers, right? Um, and all of those, uh, Congress almost never uh, 
goes back to, to revise its work. It almost never goes back and takes away power that it once gave to an agency. Sometimes it does that, but, but quite rarely. And so the, the result is essentially a one-way ratchet for each agency. And then when you take into account, I said earlier, that all of those agencies um, report uh, to the president in, in some way, the independent agencies much less so, um, uh, what you have is a, a very deep, unknowably deep reservoir of presidential power. Right? The president doesn't know his powers. No one knows the president's powers. That's why you have, um, I, I think, quite shocking uh, uh, instances like the eviction moratorium, where um, it was felt to be uh, desirable from a policy perspective that people not be evicted during COVID, understandable desire. Uh, and um, it was discovered that CDC had this uh, quarantine authority that could be used, some lawyers thought, to, uh, to pursue that, that objective. And then you see that with the, most recently with student loan, uh, uh, to my mind, debacle. So um, you have the creation of these authorities that are, that are responsive to particular urgencies that remain on the books forever and that all continue to, to enlarge this, this pool of power. And so um, the president can't do everything, but no one knows what he can do. Uh, and and that's, that's pretty problematic. I'd, I'd agree with that. I would say we need oversight because of these delegations. It's interesting that the same year that Congress enacted the APA for greater judicial oversight of administration, Congress also passed the Congressional Reorganization Act to reorganize itself, to gear towards oversight, at least as much, if not more, than uh, legislation. Uh, oversight's important, but I think it's now become the, the horse instead of the cart and legislation now takes up such a, a small role. I worry a lot, frankly, about the style of oversight now, uh, where hearings call not just government officials ahead to, 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 to come to, 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 for account, um, but the extent to which oversight has become a tool of political oversight of the public, bringing the private sector into these hearings and haranguing them um, outside of the, the protections of, of the judicial process. I think we should worry about that a lot, especially when it's a president's own party, sort of in conjunction with or parallel to the Justice Department, purporting to oversee the public rather than government. I, I think that's totally right. I would offer that uh, Congress may not have gotten the bargain it thought it was getting when it uh, authorized the agencies and then thought it could control them through the oversight process. Yeah. If, if, the, if the question is, is a committee of jurisdiction versus an agency in its head, then very often the committee is more powerful. That's not so if it's the, if it's the committee versus the president, right? And as presidential control um, uh, appropriately has become more robust over the agencies, the oversight mechanism uh, has become less effective. Uh, you know, you're going to be hard pressed to find a cabinet secretary who departs from his boss's will to please uh, the, the committee. Any other questions in the back middle? Thank you very much. I'm Kent Lastman with the Competitive Enterprise Institute. And uh, picking up on our title this evening, if the moral legitimacy of our government, as we're told in the Declaration of Independence, comes from the consent of the governed, is it legitimate for independent agencies not to be accountable to the political branches of government in the creation and promulgation of rules. Right now we have approximately 25 to one ratio of rules to laws. Is that legitimate? Is that moral? Well, no, I mean, it's not, it's, no, it's not operating obviously consistently with the constitutional supervisory structure. I mean, I, and it's all based on Humphrey's executor. What's interestingly, this Walmart case um, where FTCs brought an enforcement action against them um, is trying to get the court to revisit really the impact of Humphrey's by observing that um, in Humphrey's executor, even though it's been used by the Supreme Court to justify all sort of manner of um, independent power operating free from executive supervision, it was really just endorsing that for fairly modest kind of investigative and um, study um, functions um, 
back in the 1930s, and now the modern state, the Ministry of State is empowered by Congress, is doing significantly more. And so perhaps if anyone ever gets the Supreme Court to squarely consider that issue, um, it would not let its sort of respect for precedent or desire to issue opinions that are as consistent with precedent as it can um, intrude on re-examining what the modern agencies are doing now with vastly different power than they had in the past. But I mean, obviously, no. And, and the problem is because, again, no individual um, officer or entity can be purely good on their own. They need a structure within which to operate. And so if the independent agency is supposed to help the corruption for the corruption of the political president, the trouble is there's nobody to watch the independent commissioner or the independent counsel or whoever else might be operating with um, unrestrained power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's it's uh, certainly much better for an agency be agency to be supervised by the president than to be supervised by no one. Uh, that that said, uh, you know, the founders did not think that that accountability. Uh, even to the people was was enough to to, to create a, a just government, right? That's why uh, you have the protections that are described in Federalist Ten, right? That the 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 concern uh, with uh, with taking political accountability as a sole safeguard is that the politically accountable actor has tremendous incentives and ability to create uh, tyranny of the majority to to find a set of issues around which he can cobble together a majority, right? Um, the uh, Congress um, has great difficulty in doing that. It's, it's subject to certain procedures that make it difficult for it to do that. The president is not subject to those, those same procedures. So the, the president finds it uh, distressingly easy, uh, it seems to me, to, uh, to assemble uh, a majority uh, that, that he, you know, that, that operates in, in precisely the way that, that Madison is worried about in Federalist 10. Um, to be clear, even that is better than no accountability, uh, uh, you know, to the people through, through the president. But, but it's certainly not a, a panacea. It's not enough uh, standing alone. That was all well put. I can't add to that. Well, and that, I think, brings back in the, the federalism point from earlier, right? If it's, I mean, it's clearly not enough at the federal level. Hopefully, we have states operating in the background um, also. I mean, and that the problem with the federalist breakdown, obviously, has been, um, as Justice Thomas points out, critical to the um, growth of the government. Do we have time for one last question? Yeah, we got time for one last question. We'll take it from the room. While we're waiting, it's just a good time to point out that CEI just put out the latest 10,000 Commandments report, right? Uh, J.P. Hogan. Uh, Federalist One uses the Constitution as for inducements of philanthropy and later preservation of property. So it seemed to imply that if you're using the executive to as a metaphor for socialism or authoritarianism, that would be unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. But if, if, so it's, and then the metric is I was trying to wrap this down into one tweet, but it doesn't fit. Um, so it seems the executive state has that limit of the, the first order of the Constitution is to allow to be people almost as pilgrims going forth to self-govern in religion locally. So where is the metric besides that on whether his moral 51 votes, 60 votes, two-thirds vote, if it's contrary to even Federalist One? I guess I, I would just say... I don't know what, what the, the ideal line is, but the, the more that has to be done through Congress, through at least a majority, and oftentimes through procedures that require some kind of supermajority or process of elections, um, I'm, I'm hopeful that that legislative process has less, has less risk of profound moral errors, right? Those processes will at least elevate more viewpoints and remind each member of Congress, of everything else that's at stake outside of their narrow interests. I don't have that as much confidence with administrations. With administrations, you'll get more, uh, you'll get, surely get great things, and you'll also get surely worse things. And for government, I would just like to focus on avoiding the worst things. All right, well, with that, uh, please join me in thanking our panelists for coming today. Thank you. Thank you.